just as a quick reminder, in our last podcast, we discussed the first part of the issues management process, scanning. In this podcast, we move to the second step, monitoring. Once we have a well-organized scanning plan and information, we begin this step. While the monitoring step is often paired with scanning, and they're sometimes discussed interchangeably, monitoring is conceptually and practically a separate step. The scanning process reveals situations or problems with the potential of being an emerging organizational issue. But then this is where monitoring steps in. Monitoring means that the organization is actively watching the issue in order to make a judgment about whether it should take action to mitigate, minimize, or avoid the risk associated with the issue. Heath argues that monitoring an issue is really only worth it after the issue meets three criteria. First, is the issue being discussed or covered by journalists or other opinion leaders? Certainly in a modern context, this can occur across social media. And social media platforms offer organizations a great amount of intelligence to be able to get ahead of emergent issues because journalists, politicians, and leaders often post there before news breaks across traditional or legacy sources. Second, in order to be monitored and count as an issue, the emergent problem needs to represent a quantifiable threat in terms of the scope of the organization's reputation, markets, operations, or even its stakeholders. Organizations can cho certainly choose to monitor situations that are unlikely to it directly affect them, but if one or more of their critical stakeholders could be affected by it, they might still choose to monitor it more closely. However, because we live in a world of limited resources, most of the time that organizations are going to act on issues, it's because they'll have a measurable impact on the organization. Third and finally, in order to matter enough to be actively monitored, the issue should be championed by a group or institution with actual or potential influence over the organization directly or through its critical stakeholders. We'll be talking about how to evaluate our stakeholders in a later podcast, but determining who's really engaged with an issue and their relationship to the organization or its critical stakeholders is a prerequisite to allocating resources to monitoring. Once we've established that an issue really matters, is that all there is to the monitoring stage? Of course not. The monitoring process is about documenting the existence and or changes in an issue, tracking how it should be managed within the organization, and creating resources for decision making. The most typical way that we do this is with the risk register. A risk register is a log or database used to identify risks, their severity, and action steps that can be taken. It needs to provide a snapshot glance to see what's going on for an organization in its environment. These are meant to be living documents and regularly updated. How regularly will depend on the organization, the dynamic nature of its environment, and the resources the organization allocates to it. Risk registers are used in the most official project management logs. For example, if you ever go to project management certification, and this, by the way, is a really useful certification to have for communication managers, then you'll go through a PRINCE or a PRINCE2 certification process. Similarly, this is also being done with big data using custom algorithms, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So they can range from being quite simple to extremely complex, very visual, or a lot of content. This will vary depending on the organization, number of issues, managers, but they all have some pretty common features. So what we're going to do is go through some of the common features of a risk register to briefly define and describe them. In the resources connected to the textbook, there's a risk register template, and the textbook itself goes into much more detail on the risk register. But it's useful to talk about the key components of the monitoring process that are most common to risk registers, and yes, you can expect differences depending on the organization, industry, and preferences. So let's take a very brief look at the 12 components of monitoring using the risk register. First, we'll start with the title. You provide a brief name, and it needs to be a one to three word summary about the specific risk. For example, if you're in the fashion industry, one risk would be supplier factory safety. Second, provide a risk description. In about a sentence or phrase, you'd provide a brief description of the risk to clarify exactly what you meant by the title. 
So if we stick with the fashion industry and supplier factory safety, then the description might be the safety of the buildings used in textile factories in Southeast Asia. Third, issue management category. Here you would identify any of the four categories that could be affected, including social, economic, political, and competitor. So what would our building safety issue affect? Well, it would affect social for reputation, economic for the bottom line, political for regulations, and competitors for the industry impact. Fourth, risk category. Here you categorize the risk. Is this primarily an issue of time, cost, scope, resources, environment, reputation, or other key categories? So what kinds of categories would apply to the fashion building safety? Certainly cost, reputation, safety, supply chain, and operations could be examples. Fifth, present impact. This asks a simple question. Is the issue presently affecting the organization or likely to affect it within the next six months? Simple yes or no answer on that. Sixth is competitor impact. Is this presently affecting one or more of our competitors? Again, just a simple yes or no. Seventh is location risk. What operational locations are likely to be directly affected? Eighth, internal or external dynamic. Who is primarily affected? Is that internal, external, or both? Ninth, what stakeholders are involved? Here you identify stakeholders who are likely directly involved in the issue as in either causing or going to be immediately affected by it. This is one of the reasons why it's a good idea to do a stakeholder mapping. If you already know who your stakeholders are and what their relationship to the organization and issue is, then this becomes a lot easier. Tenth, specify and pull out the stakeholders affected. So regardless of whether they're directly involved, what stakeholders will be affected by the situation? Eleventh, identify issue champions. Regardless of involvement or impact, what stakeholders might champion the issue? And twelfth, the issue trigger. What event or events are likely to happen in order tr to uh, trigger the issue's emergence?